Yeah. My name is Seth McCoy. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Woodland Hills. Uh, if you're new here, I uh, just want to greet you and say welcome. Welcome to the thousands and thousands of people who will watch this sermon via podcast who are like a, an extended part of our family. I want to say welcome this morning. You're picking up uh, this sermon is part three uh, of a five-part sermon uh, around a topic um, that can be fairly heavy. Um, it's the topic of spiritual warfare. The, the title of the sermon series is Cage Free. Um, and what Melanie just talked about is the kind of cages that Im- imprison us. As, as human beings, we so often choose a way of living that holds us back from the way of life that God has for us because we're, we're not on our own here in this life. Um, this week, my wife uh, took a picture of a, of a memory verse. Um, now, when Jesus was uh, facing spiritual warfare and attack, one of the things that he did, a tactic that he used, is he used scripture to combat the enemy when he was like in his tough moment. And so um, I know it seems a little bit old-fashioned, but we and my family still memorize scripture from time to time. And this is one that she sent to me. Here's what it says. It's from James chapter 1. I've been sitting in it all week. It says, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know, a a test and a challenge is just another way of saying spiritual attack, right? The difference is, um, you know, Greg talked about uh, last week in the sermon, one of the things that gets him passionately frustrated is when people ascribe to God characteristics that actually belong to Satan, um, belong to our adversary and the enemy. Like we, God doesn't test us. God doesn't challenge us. Um, and yet God can meet us in that challenge. Here's what it says. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. I'm going to read that again. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Here's the reason why I think she actually sent me this card is this next line. Uh, If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help, and you won't be condescended to when you ask for it. You know, Melanie in the video needed help. I many times in my life have needed help. And now I'm wondering about you. Now, I don't fly that often, but when I do fly, I have longer legs. So one of the things that I love to do is I love to try to weasel my way into an exit row. You know, like if you get an exit row, you get a little more leg room. The problem is there's a trade-off, right? If you get a little more leg room, then they're going to ask you to do a little work. And actually, the work is really hard. If the plane is going down, you're going to have a job to do to help other people get off the plane. So uh, actually, today during the sermon, we're going to do something together. It's like an activity that we're going to do uh, as a group. Uh, and for that, I'm going to need some help. So if you're on an aisle, we all know that you got the best seat in the house, right? You have a little more leg room, and so you're going to have a job to do in just a second. <clears throat> um, actually, so if you're on the aisle row to the right, there's a little cup underneath your seat. Will you grab that cup? Uh, For the rest of us, I'm going to ask that you would grab your bulletin, and in your bulletin was a colored piece of paper tucked in there. Would everybody grab that out? Everyone for this exercise is going to need this piece of paper and something to write on. So uh, from that cup that's on the right, can we, on your left, can you pass that this way? So that in case we missed a piece of paper, there's some extras in there. In case you need a pencil, it's in there. Did I get that wrong? Okay, so there's a cup with some pencils and papers in there, and if we can grab that and pass that, that way everyone has a piece of paper and everyone has a pencil. Uh, Just so you know, the third and fourth grade class this morning, they're doing a team building exercise too uh, of how to work together. We're going to see who does better, the third and fourth graders that are working together or the adults, okay? We're going to debrief after the service and see who did a better job. Okay, everyone have a piece of paper and everyone have something to write with? I want to ask you a question. Melanie talked about her struggle. I read a verse in James that talks about needing help. If you need help, you can ask God. God loves to help us. 
What's something for you that if you could snap your fingers right now and you could receive God's help, what, what do you need? What do you need help with? And I want you to take a minute with that pencil or your pen and this piece of paper, and I want you to write, summarize in one sentence or two sentences, what is it that you most need God's help for right now? And I'm going to give you about a minute to fill that out. You go right ahead and do that. And I'm going to have you pass that piece of paper down to your right, which is this way, to the person who has a white cup. All right? Pass them all down the rows. Trust me, we're going to do something with these later, okay? Pass them down. And if you're on this exit row seat, your job, you ready for it? In that white cup is also a little brown coffee sleeve. I know you got really excited like you were going to get a cup of coffee like it was first class on the airplane. That's not going to happen. Um, I want you to count the pieces of paper that just came down the aisle. I'm going to give you a second to count how many pieces of paper you have in your hand. And then I want you to write that number on the coffee sleeve. Everybody with me so far? You're going to write that number on the coffee sleeve. You're going to tuck the cup in the sleeve now with all the pieces of paper in there. So if you're on this X row, you should have a, a cup with a sleeve on it that says how many pieces of paper are in there with the pieces of paper inside. And I'm going to ask you to stand up to your feet. If you're on this aisle, go ahead, stand up. You can do it. If you have a cup in your hand with paper, stand up. Down here on the stage, we have numbers. It starts at 1 down here, and it goes all the way up to 15 over here. We're going to test your skills. We're going to see if the third and fourth graders will beat you. I don't think they will. I believe in you. So you're going to bring this cup up front, and you're going to set it on the stage with the closest number as you can to the amount of pieces of paper that you have with you, okay? And you're going to set them right up here on the stage. We need a lot of help, don't we? We need a lot of help. Uh, after two years in Bible college, I, I withdrew uh, from training to be a minister. I was pretty certain that I didn't have what it took to be a pastor. Um, and so after two years, I dropped out and I headed home and I joined the family business. The family business in my family was called the United States Marine Corps. So I, I joined boot camp and headed into the military. Uh, at that time, we were at a time of peace. So I figured I would get my four years done, head off to college uh, on the GI Bill and like kind of move on into my future. Only one problem, while I was in the Marine Corps, um, some trouble stirred up in East Africa, in the country of Somalia, and my unit got assigned to head off to war. Before I left, I went out to dinner with my parents. I, we were getting deployed just a couple days before Christmas, so we had an early Christmas, had dinner with my mom and dad, and I clearly remember as we were sitting there, both the look of pride and fear in their eyes at the same time, as they sent their still fairly irresponsible 19-year-old son across the world um, with a significant responsibility. And I'll never forget, we got onto the plane, uh, flew across the Atlantic Ocean, longest plane ride I've ever had, landed at the airport at night. And uh, to be honest, I don't know there's anything that they could have done in boot camp to prepare me for what it was going to feel like to be in someone else's country um, where there were people who were looking forward to killing me. So we, we were at the airport, which is where all the troops were. The problem was all the supplies came in by, uh, by boat. And so um, there was, uh, so that we were at the airport, all the supplies were at the seaport, and there was just one problem. They were on two opposite sides of one of the most violent cities at that time, the city of Mogadishu. And so uh, my squad got called on. Our captain said, it's your turn. So there were six of us. We got on board a truck. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the truck has four sides, so, so one of us was in the center. He was like kind of the point person looking out the front. One of us was on the left, two guys in the back, and then I had the front right corner. And I won't forget uh, my, my commanding officer. His name was Captain Snow. He was a short guy, but what he lacked in height, he made up for in volume. So he looked me in the eye and said, hey, McCoy. Um, he said, see this right here? And he kind of held his hands out, sort of like looking out. He said, this is your section. You have to defend your section or we all will have serious problems. I, I said, okay. Uh, I grabbed my rifle and I, I took that section and we pulled up the road. And just before we left the airport, we stopped at the gate and he, you know, he turned his, uh, his head out the window because he was in the front passenger seat. And he said two words, I'll never forget what they were. I'll never forget what they sounded like. He said, lock and load. And at that moment, I heard everyone's weapons go live. And I was scared to death. 
I want you to know that when we talk about a subject called spiritual warfare, this is not a lighthearted subject or topic. No one chooses to go to war. You go, you go to war when you have to. In a country that's in war or surrounded by war, I mean, there were things that I saw as we drove through that town day after day. That, that first mission was just the first one. We had 25 to 30 other like it. And every day, almost every time we went out, I would see something happening, and I literally would just say to myself, no way. There's no way that human beings can do this to each other. I just could not believe it. This topic of spiritual warfare is important because all around us in our world, if we're really looking, we see the results of what this warfare has been like. All throughout our world, we can look around and go like, God, no way. This should not be happening. The topic I want to talk to you about today and the title of the sermon is called Solitary Confinement. Greg did a masterful job last week talking about how one of the tactics of the enemy has in our spiritual warfare is the enemy tries to assassinate the character of God for the purpose of us breaking relationship with God. We were created to be in strong relationship with the Father. It's one of the things the devil hates the most. He tries to break it as much as he can. And today what we're going to talk about is the other tactic that Satan has is not only to, to disconnect us from God, but to deeply disconnect us from each other. Um, now, you know, in America, we don't have this problem, right? We get along together as one big happy community, right? We're not broken or separated from each other, right? Totally wrong. One of the main problems that we have in this country, and one of the things I want to talk about in our lives today, is the idol of individualism. Um, now, the idol of individualism has been with us for a long time, actually for generations in this country. For my grandpa, my grandpa, one of the ways that he bought into the, um, the myth of individualism was that um, he actually believed there was a verse in the Bible um, that read like this. Uh, it says, God helps those who help themselves. That's in the Bible, right? It's nowhere in the Bible. That's totally not in the Bible. Uh, but he was convinced of it, and he kind of lived his life according to that verse. So if you get stuck or in trouble... Um, he believed that you could pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? I still have no idea how that would work. I don't know what a bootstrap is, but I get the point of the phrase. Now, for me, you know, so my grandpa was a hardworking dude. God helps those who help themselves. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Kind of, you're on your own. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm part of like Generation X, so one of the things that, that we did is like we kind of rebelled against our parents. One of our favorite phrases like from the age two on up was like, you're not the boss of me, right? You're not going to tell me what to do. Now for my kids, I have, uh, I have um, two of them in high school and one of them that's in his 20s. One of the phrases I hear often from the younger generation uh, if you're in high school in here, you're totally going to, this is going to sound familiar. I hear people say this all the time. When someone's doing something that someone else isn't really sure what they think about it, um, one of the things that we say these days is like, well, you do you, right? If that's what you're going to do, then you do that, and I'm not going to worry about it. Um, the problem is when we look around at our, our society, when we look around at our lives, I just start to wonder, like, is this the way it's supposed to be? Are people supposed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Can everybody do that? If someone can't pull themselves up by their, by their bootstraps, what happens to them? What do they do? If everyone is supposed to just you do you, what happens when you doing you hurts me be doing me? What do we do about that? Is this how it's supposed to be? Paul writes a, a brilliant letter to the Ephesians, and I'm actually going to read uh, from a few different chapters of it today. The first one is going to come from Ephesians 2. And here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, don't you remember how you used to just exist? Corpses, dead in life, buried by transgressions, wandering the course of this perverse world. You were the offspring of the prince of the power of air. This is another way of saying Satan or the adversary. Uh, again, Greg, for the past two weeks, has done a brilliant job biblically showing us that like, significant part of the damage that we see in our society and in our world is because Satan is still the ruler of this world and we're still in a, in a fight. You were the offspring of the prince of the power of air. Oh, how he owned you. Melanie talked about what it's like to be owned. I know what it's like to be owned. 
But God infused our lifeless souls with life. Even though we were buried under mountains of sin and saved us by his grace, you, you and I were hopelessly stranded without God in a fractured world. But now because of Jesus and his sacrifice, all that has changed. God gathered you who were far away and brought you near to him. The great preacher of peace and love came for you. And his voice found those of you who are near and those of you who are far away. Some of you even today, you feel near. Some of you right now, you feel far away. You are no longer outcasts and wanderers, but citizens with God's people. Members of God's holy family, residents of his household, you are being built on a solid foundation. And the building is joined together stone by stone. In him you are being built together, creating a sacred dwelling place among you where God can live in the spirit. It sounds beautiful, doesn't it? All of us were individual people. We were wandering. We were far off. But now Jesus has brought us together, stone by stone. He's building something incredible here, right? It sounds easy, doesn't it? Now, some of you know, I've told my story a couple times here, uh, that I was adopted at a pretty young age, uh, at the age of five. And my life before I was adopted, um, I was basically unsupervised. And there's some positive things about that, uh, but there's a lot of negative things about that. I grew up um, in my formative years of life. I struggled to find love. I struggled to find connection. Mostly I was looking for leadership and discipline, the kind of things that you need when you're younger that make you feel safe. And so because I didn't have that kind of structure or connection or love, I was a wild child. Um, I think in both pain and anguish and loneliness, those things came out of me as like, um, as pure energy is what I was like. So when my parents adopted me, one of the first things they did uh, when, I, when I first came to live with them, uh, my clothes, they said, were sort of like homeless people clothes. And so they took me shopping where like every kindergarten kid wants to get uh, his wardrobe from. They took me to Sears for some like, all my friends had Levi's, I had tough skins. Um, <laughs> You got to be old enough, I think, to laugh at that joke because most of you don't know what that is anymore. But, and then they bought me a new pair of tennis shoes. And I, I mean, I, I specifically remember these tennis shoes. They were uh, the first pair of like running shoes that I ever had. They were, they were bright blue with three white stripes on the side made by a French company. And as soon as the lady tied these shoes on my feet, I stood up. I ran straight out the aisle, out the front door of the mall, and into the street, and I almost got hit by a car. I literally almost died on my first day in my new family because I was a wild man. Now, you should know that God, in his, like, uh, in his wisdom and in his grace, um, he put a wild kid like me in exactly the kind of family that I needed. Um, my dad and uh, my mom, they both grew up in military families, and uh, Discipline was a strong word around our house. It's in Ephesians saying that God is building a house stone by stone and putting it together. Putting a house together stone by stone isn't easy. Um, putting a kid like me into a family who had never been in a family up to this point, I want you to know it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me to trust my parents that they would love me. It took a long, long time. It's not easy for someone who can't believe that they can be loved to open themselves up to being loved. And it takes a lot of hard work for someone to love someone like that long enough for it to take. It took a long time for the McCoy family to become a family. I just want to say, lots of times people come to churches in America and go, I'm looking for community and I feel lonely and I'm looking for a connection. And why is community so hard at this church? And I just want to tell you, just as honest as I can, the reason why it's hard for individual people like us to form community together is because it's hard. It's hard for people who long to be loved to really trust and open themselves up to it, and it takes a lot of work to love someone like that. Building community and inviting people out of solitary confinement is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak. It's hard work. But I have good news for you. We have a leader who has, is not faint of heart, and we have a leader who is not weak. 
fact, in one of my favorite sections of Scripture, Jesus points at one of his disciples, and he, he says, You're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not win. They will certainly, certainly try, but they will not win. In Ephesians, a little bit further, in chapter 4, Paul talks about what is Jesus' answer for our solitary confinement. If he's the great preacher of peace and love, if he's the one who has all the wisdom of the ages, how did he say that we were supposed to fight this battle against confinement and individualism? How are we supposed to do that together? And Paul um, sort of lays it out in Ephesians chapter 4. Here's what he says. He says, Therefore I, a prisoner serving the Lord, I beg you, would you lead a life worthy of your calling? Because you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. How are we doing at that? Be patient with each other. Because you're going to get it wrong, right? Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. However, I want you to hear this loud and clear. He has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That's why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he put captivity in chains. He put captivity in chains. And in his triumph, he gave gifts to his people. Now, it's a rumor that I've heard about. I've never seen it. But I've heard that sometimes when a sports team is good enough to actually win and actually win a championship, that heroic team returns to their hometown. Now, I follow the Cubs, so that's never going to happen. I love the Vikings, and there's nothing but heartbreak in our future. I apologize about that, but that's true. But I hear in other towns, maybe across the border in another country called Wisconsin, I think that I've heard about this before, when you win a championship, the heroes return to their hometown. There's a ticker tape parade up the street um, where they sort of hold up the championship trophy and they like throw out shirts and hats to all the kids. It's like a great celebration, right? Um, This word triumph in these verses is sort of like that. A triumph wasn't just a victory, it was a victory parade. When a great Roman general would win a battle against one of the enemies, that general and the soldier would return home for the victory parade. The, the, the conquering general would lead the parade, and just behind the conquering general would be the slaves that had been captured from this other land. What Paul's saying is like, Jesus is the greatest general that we've ever seen, who won the greatest victory that this world has ever seen. And the kind of things that are in chains, the kind of defeated enemies that are back there, are things that have plagued humans from the very beginning. In this parade, greed is in chains, and suffering is in chains, and death is in chains, and racism, and hatred, and poverty, and war. Those things are now chained up, and God is giving gifts to his people. What kind of gifts get thrown out in an amazing parade like this? He says in, uh, in Ephesians 4, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. That's right. Jesus has given the gift of me to you. Aren't you so lucky? Isn't this amazing? Um, and actually, he, he, he does something difficult. Is he tells you what my job is. He tells you what our job is as leaders in the church. And he describes it as a responsibility. The responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to do the work that he really cares about, which is building up the church. It's the body of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, right? And churches have this down, right? Every church. Don't you feel like that? Every part of Woodland Hills is fitting together perfectly. Sermon over. I should say the prayer, right? As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. It sounds really simple, but it's really amazing. Do you know that even though there's clear instructions that this is the way the church is supposed to be led, it almost never happens this way. Did you know the prevailing model of the church is not this at all? 
The prevailing model of the church is like, it, uh, you know, it takes about 100 people to hire a pastor, 100 people hire a pastor, and then what they do is they say, hey, Pastor Joe, you know, they hire the pastor and say, it's your job to do all the work of the ministry, and once a year we're going to have a business meeting to let you know if we think you did a good enough job to either get a raise, stay the same, and keep the job for another year. So every year they sort of check in on the pastor. It's his job to do the ministry. It's their job to show up. And I just say, like, is that the way God imagined it? He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I mean, basically, Jesus says, it's our job as leaders in the church to make sure that everybody sort of in this war, that everybody gets a section. You know, like my Captain Snow said, Seth, this is your zone. You have to take care of this zone. If you don't take care of the zone, we are all going to have trouble. This is your job. And part of the calling of the church as leaders is to say, hey, every one of you has the ability to do certain things well. We need you. This is your section. We need you to do it well. Otherwise, it will hurt all of us. We're all depending on you. And I just want to issue a light challenge. I don't know if I've been here long enough yet, but one thing I heard about Woodland Hills before I came to work here is like, this is a high challenge church. One of the reasons why we've all made it here long enough is because even though Greg has challenged us to think about God differently, we've risen to the occasion, and I totally believe that we can do it in this case. When I was little, there used to be a cartoon on TV about a sailor man who was hope hopelessly in love with a really skinny girl named Olive Oil. And in general, he was actually a pretty sad guy. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, even though he was deeply in love with olive oil, he had an arch nemesis who was a giant of a man named Brutus who was in love with the same girl. And oftentimes, would, uh, while he was sort of coming onto olive oil, Popeye would watch kind of hopelessly. And sometimes when he was really sad, he would say, I am what I am, and that's all that I am, right? But eventually, when Brutus would persist, Popeye would get to a point where he'd say, that's all I can stands, and I can't stands no more, right? And then at this point, a powerful green substance called spinach was called for. He would pop the can and swallow it. Muscles would bulge, and he would, like, take care of the problem, right? He had to come to a point where he'd say, yeah, that's all I can stand. I can't stand it anymore. Um, in the spiritual battle... In this thing called individualism, building community, working together as a church, taking responsibility for each other. I just have to say that at times I come to a point when I look at the, the state of the church in our, um, in our society and I just, I wonder if there isn't more. I come to a point where I just go like, oh, that's all I can stand. I can't stand it anymore. I just want to know for you. When you look around this church, our church, what do you see where you say, that's all I can stand, I can't stand anymore, I have to do something about it? Okay. Um, all right, now, if you're, if you're my exit row person that brought this cup up, you're going to help us out with one more thing, and then we're going to wrap our service up after just a second. I'm going to ask Danny to come up on stage. Um, Okay, uh, so those of you that brought cups, I'm going to ask you to stand up again if you brought that cup up front. And don't move yet. You're going to come up front, and I'm going to ask you to grab a cup that has almost, or that has the same amount of pieces of paper as the one that you dropped off. Do you remember that number that you put on that cup that you wrote down on there? Great. I'm going to ask you to come up and grab a cup that has as close as you can get to that number. If the, if the cup is a little bit short, um, Saturday night, I fumbled the ball with this activity last night. It was a train wreck last night. So I have a lot of these cards that I have to pray for in my office. I brought some of them. I'm hoping you can share them with me. Um, it's that humility thing, right, what we talked about. I'm going to set them here in the center, so if you need a few extra. Um, I'm going to ask you to come and grab a cup. It's not your cup, but one that's close to that number, and I'm going to ask you to, to grab it and then head back to your seat, and then I'll give you some instructions once everybody's back to their seat, okay? I guess what I really wanted to say of all the things I said today, stories about war and adoption, and, um, is that Jesus deeply believes that we belong to each other.
And so he expects that we take responsibility for each other. And in a society and in a day where um, not only do we resist other people taking responsibility for us, we also resist taking responsibility for each other. This fight will not be easy. It's called warfare for a reason because it's really hard. But I also want to say that victory is really, really worthwhile. Can you imagine a church that takes responsibility for each other? Where every person that comes through the door understands what their role to play is and they play it to the best of their ability and they do it filled and fueled by the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what a church like that could do in this city? Some of you may not know exactly what your gift is, and that's okay. If you do know what it is, I'm pleading with you. We need you. If you know what your gift is, and you're holding back, I want to challenge you. We need you. Would you step up? If you need to know how you can do that, I'd love to stop. I'd love for you to stop by the info table. They would love to hear from you. If you don't know what your gift is and you're not sure what you can do, this is what we did in my day. I wasn't real good at a lot of stuff in the Marine Corps, so oftentimes I would get put on what was called sandbag duty because everyone could fill a sandbag, and that was oftentimes my job. We need help here on the weekends welcoming people because, like, People are looking and longing for connection. And when they walk in the door to a church, the first thing they're going to do is not hear our theology. The first thing they're going to do is ask the question, do these people want me here? And I think the answer to that is yes, isn't it? We need some people to step up in our welcome ministry. And if that's you, there's actually a little checkbox that you can use on this card or you can let folks know at the information table. For the next two weeks, we're going to be training people how we can reach out a hand of humanity and friendship to the people that are coming looking for help. Look, hardly anyone comes to a church unless they're looking for some kind of help, unless they're struggling. Now, if you grab that cup, I'm going to ask you to take one of those pieces of paper out and hand it down. I'd love everyone to take out a piece of paper. So for the past few weeks, uh, maybe a month and a half now, one of the things that we've been doing often is showing you the kind of prayer requests that are coming into our church and making it at, onto the desk of the prayer team. And we've been saying like, hey, we have a group of people that is praying for you, and we will for sure continue to do that. If you have something that you didn't want to write on that piece of paper but you do want prayer for, you can fill this out and drop it at the information table and we will pray for it. But now you have one of these in your hand. What this means is instead of all the prayers of our church going to one team, we are all holding each other in some small way. What you have right here, what you have right here is someone's need. And you have a chance to take in some small way, take responsibility and to make a connection with someone else. To lift up this prayer. Remember the verse that we started with? If any of you need something, if you need help, ask God. He loves to help. And for one moment, instead of us thinking about our own need and lifting it up, we're going to lift up the needs of each other. Almost a thousand people in a room grabbing the need of someone else and lifting it up. This is a moment, you know, a moment of connection, a moment of building community, a moment of taking responsibility. This is a moment where we are practicing spiritual warfare, walking out of our own individualism and sharing someone else's need. Danny's going to play a song for us, and while he does that, will you, in, in whatever spiritual muscles that you have of prayer, those might be well-developed after years of prayer, you might not even be sure what to say. It's okay. In whatever way that you can, can you take this need and lift it up in prayer? And then I'm going to give you a few moments to do that, and I'm going to come wrap up our service. Amen to that prayer. I'm going to ask you, um, would you take that with you this week? Put it on your bathroom mirror or kitchen counter. When you think about it, would you pray? And today, you'll also leave knowing that someone else is taking your thing that you need help with and carrying that with you. You're not carrying it by yourself. I thought about how to close this sermon up today. One of the questions that I constantly have because I always, I'm a fairly competitive person. I need to know when we're winning. One of the reasons why I love sports is because it's always clear who's winning and who's losing. I always want to know who's winning. How will we know as a church if we're winning the spiritual war? The end of this same chapter of Ephesians, here's what Paul says. Here's ways that we'll know that we're winning. Put away your lies and speak the truth to one another because we're all part of one another. 
We're winning if we can be honest with each other. When you're angry, because you will get angry, don't let it carry you into sin. Don't let the sun set with anger in your heart. Don't give the devil room to work. If you've been stealing, stop. Don't let even one rotten word seep out of your mouths. Can you imagine a church? Not one rotten word. Do you remember the beginning of Melanie's story? Do you remember the very first thing that she said was part of the root of what caused her challenge, her struggle? Verbal abuse in the home. Man, if your anger causes toxic material to come out of your mouth on the people that are around you, please stop. Please fight that. Offer only fresh words that build others up when they need it most. That way your good words will communicate grace to those who hear them. It's time to stop bringing grief to God's Holy Spirit. You've been sealed with the Spirit, marked as His own for the day of rescue. Here's what winning looks like. Banish bitterness. Get rid of it. Get rid of rage and anger. No shouting out in the gathering area. Stop yelling at each other out there, okay? Instead, be kind. A winning church is a church of kindness. Be compassionate. Every time we forgive one another, we win the war. Because we always remember that God forgave us. That's the way God won the war. Through our anointed and liberating King Jesus. Would you stand to your feet? Let me say a short prayer blessing and I'll send you on your way this week. Jesus, you're building your church. You've been doing it taking isolated individualistic people like me and putting us together into a family, knocking off the hard edges of us rugged individualists, inviting us out of our confinement and asking us to play our part, to take our section, to fight our fight well for the sake of each other and for your kingdom. I pray that you would Empower us to do that. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.